no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. The greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. It's good to see you on this Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Glad that you are here with us. Matter of fact, Thanksgiving and over because it happened on Thursday, not just because there's leftovers in the fridge, but because every day we're supposed to be thankful. So turn to your neighbor and say, I am thankful for you all the way around, both sides. Tell them, fake it if you have to, fake it till you make it. Keep that Thanksgiving spirit alive. All right, well, let's jump in. We're going to conclude our Greater Things sermon series. I know you thought that was probably going to last throughout the whole year. But uh, we've been needing to focus in on next steps that God has for us as a church. And whether you're a part of this church or not, God has next steps for every one of us as we walk by faith and not by sight. What we do today determines tomorrow. We know that probably from the principle in Scripture that says what we plant in our lives or what we sow, we will reap a harvest. So what is sown today determines the harvest of tomorrow. Who we are today in Christ is determining what that will look like tomorrow and the days to come. The question is not necessarily what we have started, but the question is what we will become, if we will finish well. So the sermon title today is called Finishing Well, realizing it's easy to start something. It's a whole different discipline to finish what you start. A few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, we voted to take some next steps as a church, and that's a radical challenge that we took on to live and give above and beyond. And frankly, it's easy to start those next steps, but the whole challenge will be, will we finish well? So in light of where we are as a church, I want to bring this challenge from Scripture that, that relates to every day we live, how we can finish well in our lives. Today, it's easy to find testimonies throughout history of those who started well but did not finish well. Uh, in our own days and times, for some of you in this audience, you'll be too young to remember a guy by the name of Pete Rose. Pete Rose was Mr. Baseball back in the day. He was known as Charlie Hustle. He was a legend in his own time, became a legend in his own mind, and as a result, did not finish well. A man who should have easily been uh, his very first year nominated into the Baseball Hall of Fame will probably never make it there because of a lack of character, a challenge in his morality, gambling on the sport, and other issues he did not finish well. When I was the age of many who were in our student ministry, O.J. Simpson was the legend of the moment. He played for the Buffalo Bills after graduating from USC as a Heisman Trophy winner. And I remember watching, he was known as the Juice, and that meant something totally different back then than it does now in his story. He was amassing all kinds of numbers on the field, breaking all kinds of records. One of the most famous football players of his day, but most of you probably remember him for this scene, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Uh, he did not finish well, and you look now at a man who is broken, and his story is greatly challenged because he didn't finish well. A man who amassed numbers on a football field became a number at Lovelock Correctional Center in Lovelock, Nevada, just until recent days. Well, we can look at all kinds of other stories. We grew up watching the Cosby family on television. Bill Cosby and the Fat Albert gang and the legend known as Bill Cosby. He was America's family. And now as we look at his life finishing up, if the accusations are accurate, he's not finishing well, then when I was growing up, Al Franken, famous on Saturday Night Live, is now a senator under great scandal, starting well, but not finishing so well. That's their stories. What about your story? What about my story? If we're not careful, like Hollywood and Washington, D.C., we are one stupid decision away from scandal and disqualification. These that were on the mountaintop of life now find themselves in the valley of disqualification. Why? Because they didn't understand what it meant to finish well. Well, I can look at common stories from the day and age in which we live, but I can look out throughout all of human history. As a matter of fact, Scripture has its stories as well. And I want to go back into Scripture because that's our compass, that's our truth. 
that guides us and directs us to understand how we can keep from making the same mistakes. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 33. Numbers 33 and verse 1. We're going to go back and I, I will teach this often because there's so much to learn in Israel's journey out of Egypt into the promised land. A picture given in the Old Testament of what God desires to do in our lives today. It's a picture. It's the story. It historically happened, but it historically happened to paint a picture for what Jesus would accomplish in your life. We also were in bondage just like Israel. We were in bondage to our sin and to the God of this world, Satan, who owned our eternity. They were enslaved to Pharaoh. You remember the story how God raised up Joseph to provide during a famine that would happen in that area of the world? His brothers would relocate that would make up Israel. And they would come and they would live there in Egypt to get the provision during the famine. And they would build their homes there and they would reside in Egypt. That worked well while Pharaoh was alive. But over the years as they multiplied, as their families grew, uh, we find different Pharaohs coming into the palace. 400 years later, there's a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, or the story of Joseph, did not appreciate who Israel was and had been in the history of Egypt, and he became a taskmaster. He had them enslaved to do his works to build a great kingdom. And now Israel was crying out for their deliverance. God would raise up a deliverer in the person of Moses. It would be a picture of Jesus the Messiah who would deliver us from our bondage as well. And what we see in their story, if we're not careful, we'll see this in our story. Let's learn from history. Go to verse 1. It says, These are the journeys of the sons of Israel by which they came out from the land of Egypt. So again, what we find here is the beginning point, the, the launching out as they leave the bondage of Egypt and they head for the promised land. Verse 2. Moses recorded their starting places according to their journeys by the command of the Lord, and these are the journeys according to their starting places. So what we're looking in on is the very launching pad of their new walk with God. They're heading for the promised land, God's provision. They're walking by faith now. Instead of being in bondage to their old life, they have a new life and a new direction. I pray that that's true for you. I pray that God has set you free. If you've never been set free from your sin, I would pray that today you'd be able to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've tried everything else. I've been there. I've done that. Nothing will ever satisfy you or fulfill you. Nothing can ever give you what you're looking for other than the one who created you, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they experience this powerful work of God in their lives. And it says, look at verse 3. So as they journeyed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day, 15th day of that first month, that on the next day after Passover, the sons of Israel started out What's it say? Boldly. They started out boldly. It's like a football team that hasn't ever won any games. And all of a sudden they get this new head coach. And all of a sudden for the first time they start winning. And they make their way to the championship game. And they come out and they look different than they did last year. Last year their heads are hanging. They feel defeated. This year all of a sudden there's a new bounce in their step. They're hitting people. They're all pumped because they're champions. And that's what you see in Israel. They started out boldly. But as we look in on their story, they're going to struggle in their journey just like we struggle in our journey. Take a look at it. As they marched out boldly, we're going to jump over to Exodus chapter 14. Jump over to Exodus chapter 14. We're going to see the rest of the story. We're going to see that they didn't always finish well. And I think if we were honest in this room, we all struggle doing things well. Maybe starting off strong, maybe making that commitment that I'm going to live different this year. I'm not going to keep going back to my old sin and yet finding ourselves struggling in the journey. In verse 10, Exodus chapter 14, we wake up uh, in numbers it showed where they started. Now as they've been walking in the wilderness, God has been teaching them how to be faithful as they struggled through the wilderness journey, as they had to trust God every day, God was showing up strong on their behalf. They had a compass. God himself was guiding them every single day. And all of a sudden, we wake up here in Exodus 14, and the Lord himself has guided them right up against the Red Sea. I wish I could 
show you a snapshot. Most Bible scholars believe on their right was this huge cliff wall. On their left, another huge cliff wall. And all of a sudden, this pathway that led them right into the Red Sea. As they're waiting there, they don't know where to turn, but God has left them there. God is right there with them, but they don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. And all of a sudden, they look out to the horizon, and they see a dust cloud. And they see a storm coming their way, and it happens to be the army of Pharaoh. Look at it, verse 10. It says, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. Pharaoh didn't want to let the people go. And I want you to understand, Satan doesn't want to let you go either. Uh, Satan's not going to just sit back just because you've made a profession of faith and say, well, I lost that one, and so I'll just go mess with... No, he will continually try to pull you back and keep you from moving on in your faith. Pharaoh and his army uh, came radically, powerfully with all their forces against Israel. Verse 11. The people cried out to Moses and said, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die here in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way? Why have you brought us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. All of a sudden, the story changes. These radical new Israelites now start to wimp out in their faith and want to start running back to the past. Maybe that's your struggle today. Maybe that's the way the enemy is trying to attack you, is trying to get you to realize that uh, you face great challenges in your faith, and it'd be easier to take the easy street and live like everybody else. Look at verse 13. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you've seen today, you will never see them again forever. For the Lord will fight for you. Listen to what Moses is going to show them. Listen, guys, I know you're fearful. Why? Because you can't fix this. You know why you're fearful? Because you don't have any weapons. You can't come against the greatest army on the planet. You are helpless. But let me remind you, the Lord will fight for you. But watch this. Watch this. Look at the rest of the verse. The Lord will fight for you when? When's it say? Read your Bible. Look at it. When will he fight for you? When you keep silent. Now that doesn't mean don't answer the preacher back. You can talk in church. What it's saying there is when you get out of the way, when you quit striving and quit trying to win the battles in your own strength, that's when the Lord shows up on your behalf. There will be times that come at you in your lifetime that you can't handle and you will be overwhelmed. But fear not, the Lord will fight for you when you keep silent. Verse 15, so the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go home, to go back to Egypt. What do you tell them to do? Go forward. You see, God calls us to press on in our faith. God calls us to the finish line because God is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. He is the one who began the good work in us and he is the one who completes it. He is the finishing God of a great work, of greater things. We just simply have to let God be God. And when we do, look at verse 30. They finally learned that lesson. Trust God, even when it doesn't make sense. It says that the Lord God saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. They believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. So we look in on this story, we find this roller coaster ride. We find people marching out boldly, starting well, and not finishing well. We find them falling back to their old ways and their fleshly ways. And we find God picking them back up and moving them along forward in their faith. And maybe that looks like your journey. I know that's been mine. And while that may be true, while we've had our ups and we've had our downs, I want you to understand that doesn't have to be the journey. It doesn't always have to be these starting strong moments and then retreating back out of fear or failure. No, we can march on. So how do we do that? Look, go, go over to chapter 15 and verse 1. They come through the Red Sea, God's deliverance and God's power. 
Not because of what they'd done, but because God split the Red Sea. God defeated their enemy and gave them victory. And when they get out on the other side, as they now move on, instead of marching out boldly this time, starting fresh and again, look at what they did in verse 1. So they got to the other side. It says, Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. They sung out to God and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Instead of just marching on and marching out in their new strength and their new victory, they paused and they realized, you know, we can't take another step unless he is the Lord of it, unless we exalt him first. And they took time like we did this morning, and they sang their praises to God. I hope this holiday season you've taken time not just to eat turkey, not just to give a Thanksgiving prayer and give God thanks, but I hope every day you wake up, you wake up like Israel did in verse 1, and you sing your praises to God. And you declare your need for him, and you exalt him high and mighty in your life, and let him be the Lord of your journey. And if he is the Lord of your journey, the work he began in you, guess what he will do? He will finish that work and he will complete it. That's who God is. So the first thing they did, they cried out to God. They looked to him for their strength. And as we do the same moving forward so we can finish well, I want to challenge you with just some simple truths from their story and from Paul's. The first truth we're going to see from Israel is this, that to finish strong doesn't mean we won't struggle along the way. Just like Israel had their struggles, you'll have yours. And instead of in the time of struggle, giving up and saying, man, I can't do it. Man, I can't move on. You're right, you can't. But you can do all things through Christ. You can't do it in your own strength and God doesn't want you to. God wants to display his strength like he did at the Red Sea. He wants to do that in your life every day. That's how you finish well. And so as you work through your struggles... Trust God to complete the work he's begun in you. David, we've talked about it often. David had a number of struggles. David was a mighty man, a man after God's own heart. He lived a great story, a great testimony, but there's a chapter in there, a chapter in his story where he struggled and he failed. No matter of fact, out of those failures in your Bible, you'll see a number of chapters called the book of Psalms. Many of those Psalms or David pouring out his heart to God because he felt like he had failed God. And yet he would sing about how God would never leave him, how God would never forsake him, and how God would always deliver him. And in the end, if you read all of David's story, David finished well. We've talked about Peter a number of times. Uh, Supposedly the strongest of all 12 of the disciples, yet he would deny Christ three times. I'm sure he thought in his heart, man, I failed the Lord. I did what I thought I'd never do. I got to quit. I'm not qualified to be a disciple. And yet Jesus said, Peter, I've prayed for you. And I've prayed that you would make it through this season, this moment. I will complete the work I've begun in you. And when you repent, when you turn back, when you trust me again, I will use you for my glory. Peter be the first one to preach the very first sermon ever preached on planet earth after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He finished well. We can look throughout all of Scripture, and you won't see anybody who doesn't have a dark chapter in their story, a season where they struggled. But it's in those struggling seasons that God gets our attention the greatest and where God can glorify himself the most. I preached on the lesson of the loaves uh, several years ago back in Tulsa. I was looking through some old notes and found this letter that was written to me after the lesson loves. That's what we studied last Sunday. This particular lady wrote about her story. They were struggling. She was ready to quit on her marriage, ready to quit on her God and her family. And she wrote me this letter. She said, Bill, you know how turbulent the last couple of years have been in our lives, so I wanted to pass on this praise, Exodus 15, verse 1. Last year at this time, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, My husband was out of state for cancer treatments. My mom was trying to recover from colon cancer and a broken vertebrae. I was still trying to clean up from the three floods that hit my house in one week. Money was so tight I had to sell all my jewelry so my daughter and I would have money to eat. Relationships with our other family members were broken into a thousand pieces. Thanksgiving was coming up the very next weekend and I dreaded it with all of my heart. My husband wouldn't be there. The big kids had made other plans, and I couldn't afford to even go see my mom for Thanksgiving. 
After a lifetime of cooking big Thanksgiving dinners for family and friends and hearing all the laughter and screams of kids from all ages in our home, it'd be mostly just me and my daughter this Thanksgiving. I spent, tr- I spent the day trying as hard as I could to make it a good day for her, but my heart was broken. I couldn't see a way through the damage done to my family, and I was truly mourning. Yesterday, I was humbled and amazed at the work that God has done in our lives. See, this letter was written a year later after that disastrous Thanksgiving. Twelve months later, she said, Here I was, now in God's house, holding my husband's healthy and loving hand. My relationships have been healed. My grandkids are in Sunday school this morning and thanking God for my mom's full recovery. It's truly a cornucopia of miracles right here in the back pew. Last year, I could not begin to even imagine that any of this was even possible. But that's because I'm still trying to learn the lessons of the loaves. If you weren't here last Sunday, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and the disciples, they didn't learn the lesson of the loaves either, that God is the God of the miraculous. He's the God of greater things. And just a day later, while they experienced the great power of God on one day, the very next day in the middle of a storm, they forgot the lessons of the loaves. The storm overwhelmed them. Instead of looking to God in their circumstance, realizing he's the God of yesterday, today, and forever, they began to fail. She said, I too had forgotten the lessons of the loaves. I still let what I see with my eyes harden my heart if I'm not careful and vigilant. Or vigilant. As a result, I'm cooking Thanksgiving dinner this year, and I'm adding a new menu item. I'm adding a loaf of homemade bread to remind me and my family that all things are possible when God is invited to the table. A family that should have fallen apart, a family who had no hope, experienced the lessons of the loaves. They experienced the power of God on display in their lives personally and in their lives as a family as they trusted God even when it hurt the most. So how do we do that? It's easy to look back and see those who start strong and see their failures. Then we see people like David and Paul finish strong or Peter or whoever it might be. How did they finish strong? I want to show it to you very quickly. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Find 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be in verse 5. And Paul is going to share with us the secret of finishing well. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. Paul pours out his heart. By the way, this is one of the last letters he would write. He is writing almost his last will and testament. And he's writing back to a young man who was his son in the faith. He had been very inspirational. I don't know if he actually led Timothy to the Lord, but he certainly was his earthly spiritual father. He had poured his whole life into Timothy, and he now writes this last letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. He is already telling Timothy, Timothy, it's not going to be easy. If it was easy, everybody could do it. Everybody could start strong and could finish well if it was easy, but you're going to have hardships. Can I remind everyone in this room, there are going to be hard days. Don't let those hard days cripple you and don't let those hard days destroy you. Let God finish what he's begun in you, finish well. And how do you do that? He said, Timothy, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Don't get distracted, Timothy. Keep focused on greater things. Even when things aren't great in your life, you keep doing the greater works, be an evangelist, share the gospel, tell people how they can be saved, and fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Paul finished well. And there are three things, very quickly, I want you to take note of, and three things that I hope you will experience every day you wake up. Number one, the Apostle Paul lived a disciplined life. He said, I have fought the good fight. I've stayed true to the fight plan. I didn't venture off of it. I didn't stray away from it. I didn't throw in the towel. I didn't quit and I didn't give up. I kept fighting the fight. He lived a disciplined life. He didn't allow the pain of life to conquer him. He didn't allow the issues and the struggles of life to cripple him. 
Matter of fact, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but if you listen in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, here was my story. He said, in everything we were commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in many afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in our beatings and being imprisoned, in our tumults and in labors and sleeplessness and in hunger, we stayed focused on greater things. You see, for the Apostle Paul, his journey wasn't easy. The chapters were very difficult in his story. And yet he trusted God through each and every one of those moments because he was disciplined in his life. Every day he woke up. It wasn't what could I get out of life. It's who can I take life to. It wasn't about him being more comfortable or more satisfied. All he could stay focused on was being that evangelist of telling people how they could find life through Jesus Christ. He stayed disciplined in his journey. The second thing we see is that he lived a directional life. He said, for I have finished my course. He didn't take shortcuts. He didn't take uh, side detours. He didn't run a course that he wanted to run. He said, I finished my course. He realized that God had a plan and God had a purpose and he needed to follow that plan no matter what. And he stayed to it. He lived by the compass. He allowed the Holy Spirit to empower him, the word of God to guide him, and he finished the course. He finished well because he had a map. And he had a compass. What's directing your life right now? What is it that leads you to make the choices you make? What's the driving force of your journey? Is it greater things? Or is it lustful things? Is it the things of God's kingdom or the things of the kingdom you're trying to build? Paul stayed focused. He said, I have finished my course. And he did it all the way to the end. Yesterday, as I was putting the message together, I, I found this on Twitter that blew me away, a real-life example of a daddy finishing well. You can see a picture here of the Twitter page for Bailey Sellers. I don't know Bailey. Somebody retweeted this, another pastor, I think it was, retweeted her tweet, and you can't read it. You can see there the flowers on the left, the letter from her daddy, a picture of her and her daddy when she was younger. She said, my dad passed away when I was 16 from cancer. Before he died, he prepaid flowers so I could receive them every birthday that I had. This is my 21st birthday flowers. Her birthday was yesterday. And it was the last batch of flowers that she got from her daddy. She says, I miss you so much, daddy. The letter, apparently, knowing he was coming to the end of his life, five years ago, he prepaid for flowers to show up every year on her birthday till she turned 21. He wanted to make sure he saw her through those formative years until she would go on to be that young lady to, to have that adult life that she would strive for. He wasn't going to be there. He wasn't going to be there to walk her down the aisle, to give her away to a young man. He wasn't going to be there, and yet he determined in his heart he would finish well and he would be there. And every year on her birthday, she received flowers and a card. The card that's up there on the screen, I want to read it to you. You may not be able to see it. It says, Bailey, this is my last love letter to you until we meet again. I don't want you to shed another tear for me, my baby girl, for I'm in a better place. You are and you always will be the most precious jewel I was given. It is your 21st birthday and I want you to always respect your mama and stay true to yourself. Be happy. Live a life to the fullest. I will still be with you through every milestone. Just look around. There I will be. I love you, boo-boo. Happy birthday, daddy. 21 years old. She was still getting flowers and a card from her daddy. Because here was a dad who said, I will not quit. Even if cancer gets me, I'm not done being a daddy. I'm going to show up and I'm going to be the man I need to be for my girl. And so he took this radical step. And I can tell you, that little girl knows the love of her father. That little girl doesn't have to go find it somewhere else. She's found it by a daddy who finished well, even though he had cancer. Can I tell you, every day I wake up, I got that kind of daddy too. And I mess up, and I may do my boo-boos, and I may blow it, and I may fall short of the glory of God, but can I tell you the cool thing? 
The cool thing I know today is I have the love of my Heavenly Father who loves me with an undying, unconditional love, who will never leave me nor forsake me. And that daddy, that daddy who began a good work in me, that daddy will complete it. See, the Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. That work that God began in me when he transformed my life, I'm able to lay down my life now and I can finish my race because God has completed it. He lived a directional life life. He lived with purpose. He lived with direction. And the last thing is he lived a devoted life. He said, I've kept the faith. I've been faithful to the end. I would not give up. I would not hang up. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to do those greater things all the way to the end. I testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul finished well, not because he was stronger, not because he's a better Christian than you or me, but because he was disciplined in his faith, he was directed in his faith, and he was devoted in that faith. And even when he was being beaten, and even when he was being thrown in prison, and even when life was not good, wasn't great, he stayed focused on greater things. That's how you finish well. That's how you bring glory to God. It's pretty simple. Let's pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Finishing well. I used to think that it was up to me, man. I had to be stronger. I had to be more faithful. I had to do this. I had to do that. Man, I always fell short of the glory of God. And it wasn't until I realized it wasn't Bill that completes the work that God began. It's God, my heavenly Father, who never leaves me, who never forsakes me, who begins the work and who finishes the work, the author and finisher of my faith. Some of you are ready to stop being faithful, maybe in a marriage, maybe in a task, maybe in your faith. The enemy has lied to you like he did Israel and said it's better to go back to your old life than to experience this tough life of faith. It's a lie. It seems so real, but it's a lie. Don't listen to it. Be faithful. And even in the storm, remember the lesson of the loaves. That supernatural God who miraculously provided when the sun was shining and when people needed something to eat is the same God who shows up in the darkness of a storm in the middle of the sea. He doesn't change. Our circumstances change. He doesn't. Let God finish what he's begun in you. Now, what do you do with it? Well, for some, you may have to declare like Israel, Lord, help me. Lord, the enemy's about to drown me. God, I can't do it. God, be my deliverer. And he will. Be my strength. He will. Be my victory. He will. Our ministers are going to be here at the front. Our prayer warriors will be here as well. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you when we stand in a moment. If God is speaking to you, if you need somebody to pray with, if you have a decision you need to make for Christ, if you need to give your life to him, then you come. Just step out. Let God destroy the enemy of your soul and give you a new life. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe you just need somebody to pray for you. We'd love to minister to you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, may you be glorified in this moment. Like Israel experienced at the Red Sea, God, may you wipe out the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. God, bring victory today in this very place. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If our men- hey, my name's Brelin. You're watching Connection Points, and this is what's going on at PCBC. We are kicking off the I Love My Church giving campaign on Sunday, December 10th. And so on December 3rd, you will be receiving special offering envelopes in your Sunday school class. On December 10th, your special one-time gift will help us kick off the campaign. We invite you to pray about how you can launch with your largest gift. We also ask that you would be in prayer about the monthly gifts you would give over the next year. 
Our friends at Pioneers would like to invite everyone to come right here to the Worship Center on Thursday, November 30th at 1 p.m. to hear special musical guest, The Darts. And this is our last Pioneers for 2017, so you don't want to miss it. We have an ABF party night coming up Friday, December 1st, and childcare will be provided. We just need you to go to pcbc.tv slash events to sign up for that. If you like cinnamon toast and hot cocoa and you're a preschooler or a family member of a preschooler, come on out to Making Memories right here at the church, Sunday, December 3rd at 4 p.m. We have an awesome afternoon packed full of activities that you don't want to miss. The Ladies Christmas Tea is happening Saturday, December 9th, and tickets are on sale through next Sunday, so you can get those in the hub or online at pcbc.tv slash events. And here is Laurelyn with more information. Hey ladies, I have some more information for you about our Christmas tea on December 9th. Not only is there gonna be lots of yummy food, but also you're gonna to get to hear from a special young lady whose life has been touched through Children's Hope. Her life has just been changed. You don't wanna miss it. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a really great week and we will see you soon. All right, I also wanna remind you our Wiley Post uh, Christmas coat Christmas caps and Christmas gloves uh, giving campaign is going to end next week. So if you've not yet done so and would like to participate in that, bring your coat for a kid, a cap for a kid, and or some gloves or mittens or scarves for a kid. I'll put them in the buggies next week, and then we'll pack those up and get those over with those that we've already sent in hopes to prepare them for the cold weather that the weatherman says eventually is coming. Uh, what, whatever you do, though, remember as we're dismissed that God loves you and so do we. Have a great week.
heart. My husband wouldn't be there. The big kids had made other plans, and I couldn't afford to even go see my mom for Thanksgiving. After a lifetime of cooking big Thanksgiving dinners for family and friends and hearing all the laughter and screams of kids from all ages in our home, it'd be mostly just me and my daughter this Thanksgiving. I spent, I spent the day trying as hard as I could to make it a good day for her, but my heart was broken. I couldn't see a way through the damage done to my family, and I was truly mourning. Yesterday, I was humbled and amazed at the work that God has done in our lives. See, this letter was written a year later after that disastrous Thanksgiving. Twelve months later, she said, Here I was, now in God's house, holding my husband's healthy and loving hand. My relationships have been healed. My grandkids are in Sunday school this morning and thanking God for my mom's full recovery. It's truly a cornucopia of miracles right here in the back pew. Last year, I could not begin to even imagine that any of this was even possible. But that's because I'm still trying to learn the lessons of the loaves. If you weren't here last Sunday, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and the disciples, they didn't learn the lesson of the loaves either, that God is the God of the miraculous. He's the God of greater things. And just a day later, while they experienced the great power of God on one day, the very next day in the middle of a storm, they forgot the lessons of the loaves. The storm overwhelmed them. Instead of looking to God in their circumstance, realizing he's the God of yesterday, today, and forever, they began to fail. She said, I too had forgotten lessons of the loaves. I still let what I see with my eyes harden my heart if I'm not careful and vigilant. Or vigilant. As a result, I'm cooking Thanksgiving dinner this year, and I'm adding a new menu item. I'm adding a loaf of homemade bread to remind me and my family that all things are possible when God is invited to the table. A family that should have fallen apart a family who had no hope experienced the lessons of the loaves. They experienced the power of God on display in their lives personally and in their lives as a family as they trusted God even when it hurt the most. So how do we do that? It's easy to look back and see those who start strong and see their failures. Then we see people like David and Paul finish strong or Peter or whoever it might be. How did they finish strong? I want to show it to you very quickly. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Find 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be in verse 5. And Paul is going to share with us the secret of finishing well. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. Paul pours out his heart. By the way, this is one of the last letters he would write. He is writing almost his last will and testament. And he's writing back to a young man who was his son in the faith. He had been... Very inspirational. I don't know if he actually led Timothy to the Lord, but he certainly was his earthly spiritual father. He had poured his whole life into Timothy, and he now writes this last letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. He is already telling Timothy, Timothy, it's not going to be easy. If it was easy, everybody could do it. Everybody could start strong and could finish well if it was easy, but you're going to have hardships. Can I remind everyone in this room, there are going to be hard days. Don't let those hard days cripple you and don't let those hard days destroy you. Let God finish what he's begun in you, finish well. And how do you do that? He said, Timothy, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Don't get distracted, Timothy. Keep focused on greater things. Even when things aren't great in your life, you keep doing the greater works, be an evangelist, share the gospel, tell people how they can be saved. And fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Paul finished well. And there are three things, very quickly, I want you to take note of, and three things that I hope you will experience every day you wake up. Number one, the Apostle Paul lived a disciplined life. He said, I have fought the good fight. I've stayed true to the fight plan. I didn't venture off of it. I didn't stray away from it. I didn't throw in the towel. I didn't quit and I didn't give up. I kept fighting the fight. He lived a disciplined life. 
He didn't allow the pain of life to conquer him. He didn't allow the issues and the struggles of life to cripple him. Matter of fact, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but if you listen in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, here was my story. He said, in everything we were commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in many afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in our beatings and being imprisoned, in our tumults and in labors and sleeplessness and in hunger. We stayed focused on greater things. You see, for the Apostle Paul, his journey wasn't easy. The chapters were very difficult in his story. And yet he trusted God through each and every one of those moments because he was disciplined in his life. Every day he woke up. It wasn't what could I get out of life. It's who can I take life to. It wasn't about him being more comfortable or more satisfied. All he could stay focused on was being that evangelist of telling people how they could find life through Jesus Christ. He stayed disciplined in his journey. The second thing we see is that he lived a directional life. He said, for I have finished my course. He didn't take shortcuts. He didn't take uh, side detours. He didn't run a course that he wanted to run. He said, I finished my course. He realized that God had a plan and God had a purpose and he needed to follow that plan no matter what. And he stayed to it. He lived by the compass. He allowed the Holy Spirit to empower him, the word of God to guide him, and he finished the course. He finished well because he had a map. He had a compass. What's directing your life right now? What is it that leads you to make the choices you make? What's the driving force of your journey? Is it greater things or is it lustful things? Is it the things of God's kingdom or the things of the kingdom you're trying to build? Paul stayed focused. He said, I have finished my course. And he did it all the way to the end. Yesterday, as I was putting the message together, I, I found this on Twitter that blew me away, a real-life example of a daddy finishing well. You can see a picture here of the Twitter page for Bailey Sellers. I don't know Bailey. Somebody retweeted this. Another pastor, I think it was, retweeted her tweet, and you can't read it. You can see there the flowers on the left, the letter from her daddy, a picture of her and her daddy when she was younger. She said, my dad passed away when I was 16 from cancer. Before he died, he prepaid flowers so I could receive them every birthday that I had. This is my 21st birthday flowers. Her birthday was yesterday, and it was the last batch of flowers that she got from her daddy. She says, I miss you so much, daddy. The letter, apparently, knowing he was coming to the end of his life five years ago, he prepaid for flowers to show up every year on her birthday till she turned 21. He wanted to make sure he saw her through those formative years until she would go on to be that young lady to, to have that adult life that she would strive for. He wasn't going to be there. He wasn't going to be there to walk her down the aisle, to give her away to a young man. He wasn't going to be there, and yet he determined in his heart he would finish well and he would be there. And every year on her birthday, she received flowers and a card. The card that's up there on the screen, I want to read it to you. You may not be able to see it. It says, Bailey, this is my last love letter to you until we meet again. I don't want you to shed another tear for me, my baby girl, for I'm in a better place. You are and you always will be the most precious jewel I was given. It is your 21st birthday and I want you to always respect your mama and stay true to yourself. Be happy. Live a life to the fullest. I will still be with you through every milestone. Just look around. There I will be. I love you, boo-boo. Happy birthday, daddy. 21 years old. She was still getting flowers and a card from her daddy. Because here was a dad who said, I will not quit. Even if cancer gets me, I'm not done being a daddy. I'm going to show up and I'm going to be the man I need to be for my girl. And so he took this radical step. And I can tell you, that little girl knows the love of her father. That little girl doesn't have to go find it somewhere else. She's found it by a daddy who finished well, even though he had cancer. Can I tell you, every day I wake up, I got that kind of daddy too. And I mess up, and I may 
do my boo-boos and I may blow it and I may fall short of the glory of God, but can I tell you the cool thing? The cool thing I know today is I have the love of my Heavenly Father who loves me with an undying, unconditional love who will never leave me nor forsake me. And that daddy, that daddy who began a good work in me, that daddy will complete it. See, the Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. That work that God began in me when he transformed my life, I'm able to lay down my life now and I can finish my race because God has completed it. He lived a directional life. He lived with purpose. He lived with direction. And the last thing is, he lived a devoted life. He said, I've kept the faith. I've been faithful to the end. I would not give up. I would not hang up. Acts chapter 20, verse 24 but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to do those greater things all the way to the end. I testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul finished well, not because he was stronger, not because he's a better Christian than you or me, but because he was disciplined in his faith. He was directed in his faith. He was devoted in that faith. And even when he was being beaten, and even when he was being thrown in prison, and even when life was not good, wasn't great, he stayed focused on greater things. That's how you finish well. That's how you bring glory to God. It's pretty simple. Let's pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Finishing well. I used to think that it was up to me, man. I had to be stronger. I had to be more faithful. I had to do this. I had to do that. Man, I always fell short of the glory of God. And it wasn't until I realized it wasn't Bill that completes the work that God began. It's God, my heavenly Father, who never leaves me, who never forsakes me, who begins the work and who finishes the work, the author and finisher of my faith. Some of you are ready to stop being faithful, maybe in a marriage, Maybe in a task, maybe in your faith. The enemy has lied to you like he did Israel and said, it's better to go back to your old life than to experience this tough life of faith. It's a lie. It seems so real, but it's a lie. Don't listen to it. Be faithful. And even in the storm, remember the lesson of the loaves. That supernatural God who miraculously provided when the sun was shining and when people needed something to eat is the same God who shows up in the darkness of a storm in the middle of the sea. He doesn't change. Our circumstances change. He doesn't. Let God finish what he's begun in you. Now, what do you do with it? Well, for some, you may have to declare like Israel, Lord, help me. Lord, the enemy's about to drown me. God, I can't do it. God, be my deliverer. And he will. Be my strength. He will. Be my victory. He will. Our ministers are going to be here at the front. Our prayer warriors will be here as well. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you when we stand in a moment. If God is speaking to you, if you need somebody to pray with, if you have a decision you need make, to make for Christ, if you need to give your life to him, then you come. Just step out. Let God destroy the enemy of your soul and give you a new life. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe you just need somebody to pray for you. We'd love to minister to you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, may you be glorified in this moment. Like Israel experienced at the Red Sea, God, may you wipe out the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. God, bring victory today in this very place. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If our ministers could come, prayer warriors, let's stand together. Alex is singing. If you need to experience God or share what God's doing in your life in any way, you come right now. The rest are singing and praying. If you need to come, you come. Alex. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest and without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart 
where sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you and every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness how I need you. It's good to declare that, like Israel, God, we need you. I would tell you the same is true for us as a congregation. If you're a guest today, I want you to just listen in. That I'm speaking in now into the heart of PCBC. As members of PCBC, God's called us to take next steps. Uh, we have been called to trust Him. And on December the 10th, we're going to launch a giving campaign to help us build a children's building and remodel our preschool. It's a radical step we have to take. And I'll tell you, uh, there's not a person in this room that can write a check and do it. But God wants to do it through his people. And we've made a commitment to pray and to seek the Lord and to cry out. You know, if Israel would have cried out, not just in their time of trouble, but would have cried out every day, they wouldn't have found themselves in fear in a time of trouble. They would have just been experiencing the Lord day by day. So we're doing that as a church. I want to call us into a season of prayer just for a few moments. If you're not comfortable praying with somebody, you could just find a seat where you are and just pray by yourself. Maybe you just talk to the Lord about what's going on in your world or your journey. But those who'd be willing, if you'd find somebody or several to huddle up with and pray, let's go to the Lord and pray. We're, we're praying for December the 10th. On that day, we're asking all the members of this fellowship who would be willing to participate to bring their best Christmas gift above and beyond their tithe, to launch the campaign, a one-time gift on that Sunday. We're trying to create the largest kickoff we can to help us pay off that building. Then after December the 10th, we're also praying that we might all find something, a lunch, the lesson of the loaves, a small gift we could give above and beyond our tithe every month for the next 12 months. We need to pray about what the Lord's will is in that and pray for God's provision. So would you pray for greater things, for the ministries that God wants to do through our lives and how he wants to do that through our stewardship. Let's pray together for a moment. Huddle up. Pray for God to speak to you about your, your part in that journey. And then I'll close us in just a moment. Father God, like Israel, we lift our voices to you and acknowledge we need you. Every hour, we need you. Every day, we need you. Every way, we need you, Lord. Especially as we take these next steps of faith. I pray, Lord, you, our shepherd, would guide us and direct us, that you would speak to each and every one of us how we might live above and beyond for your glory and to do greater things. God, will hear your voice and follow you. And we do it all in the name of Jesus and for his sake. All God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated right where you are. Brian Weaver's going to come and lead us in our worship.
Ushers, if you go and take your places. December 10th is a huge day in our church, and like Pastor Bill said, that's the day that we really show what our first fruits are to God for all that he's done for us. But I do want to remind us that it's not just the building that we're building, but it's about the lives and the families that are going to be impacted through that building. And it's about growing the kingdom of God. It's nothing about PCBC. It's nothing about a building that's built, but it's about lives being changed forever. Let's pray. Dear the Father, Lord, I come to you right now. I just thank you. I thank you for this opportunity we have to come and worship you. Not only in this week of Thanksgiving, but I pray that we're thankful each and every day of our lives that we have such a tremendous opportunity to bless this city. Lord, I know you don't need us, but I thank you that you use us to grow your kingdom. And now today, as we give back to you what's already yours, I pray that lives are changed because of what we give back to you. For it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Hey, my name's Breland. You're watching Connection Points, and this is what's going on at PCBC. We are kicking off the I Love My Church giving campaign on Sunday, December 10th. And so on December 3rd, you will be receiving special offering envelopes in your Sunday school class. On December 10th, your special one-time gift will help us kick off the campaign. We invite you to pray about how you can launch with your largest gift. We also ask that you would be in prayer about the monthly gifts you would give over the next year. Our friends at Pioneers would like to invite everyone to come right here to the Worship Center on Thursday, November 30th at 1 p.m. to hear special musical guest, The Darts. And this is our last Pioneers for 2017, so you don't want to miss it. We have an ABF party night coming up Friday, December 1st, and childcare will be provided. We just need you to go to pcbc.tv slash events to sign up for that. If you like cinnamon toast and hot cocoa and you're a preschooler or a family member of a preschooler, come on out to Making Memories right here at the church Sunday, December 3rd at 4 p.m. We have an awesome afternoon packed full of activities that you don't want to miss. The ladies Christmas tea is happening Saturday, December 9th and tickets are on sale through next Sunday. So you can get those in the hub or online at pcbc.tv slash events. And here is Laurelyn with more information. Hey ladies, I have some more information for you about our Christmas tea on December 9th. Not only is there gonna be lots of yummy food, but also you're gonna to get to hear from a special young lady whose life has been touched through Children's Hope. Her life has just been changed. You don't wanna miss it. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a really great week and we will see you soon. All right, I also wanna remind you our Wiley Post uh, Christmas coat Christmas caps and Christmas gloves uh, giving campaign is going to end next week. So if you've not yet done so and would like to participate in that, bring your coat for a kid, a cap for a kid, and or some gloves or mittens or scarves for a kid. Uh, put them in the buggies next week, and then we'll pack those up and get those over with those that we've already sent in hopes to prepare them for the cold weather that the weatherman says eventually is coming. Uh, what, whatever you do, though, remember as we're dismissed that God loves you and so do we. Have a great week.